thank you. So we might be closing the doors then, maybe. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Jens Nee. Uh, I'm working for Ro the Rosen Group. Um, I'm giving a talk about the very beginning of our data science success stories that you probably all have in the, in the projects. We see that in a moment. Um, I'll be, due to the technical problems that we had at the very beginning, forced to really rush through the presentation, um, which I was expecting a bit, so I've prepared a bit for that. We see that. So, as I said, Jens Nies, my name, I'm, my background is exper experimental physics. Um, when I studied physics, I, I also got into Python, that is, more than 20 years ago. I started with Python with a one before the first dot, and it immediately catched me. I was driving all the experiments uh, with that, and introduced that as a prototyping language for the company that I work for. I work for Rosen, I work at the Technology and Research Center, which is really the backbone for all the new technology that we use throughout the world. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on GitHub. Um, for those of you who would like to really follow that talk, there's no need to download it. It's available on my GitHub repository. You can recap it afterwards and simply lean back and enjoy. Run up all the way to Temple Park if you do uh, questions in the break afterwards. That's good. That's nice. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, the usual data science workflow success looks like this. You have data, you will be applying fancy algorithms, and you've got awesome results. The usual talk is focusing on the latter one. I won't. Uh, we will be talking about the usual suspects at the very beginning, which is often overlooked and underestimated to get to. So the story behind this, um, as I said, I work for Rosen. Um, we are renowned for doing pipeline inspection services, which is, at first glance, not really data related. But we are the ones building devices, traveling uh, through the pipeline, these pigs, pigs and pipe for pipeline inspection gauge. Um, these are traveling along the pipeline, collecting data by measuring the complete circumference of the pipeline, we're running for more than a thousand kilometers. Such a device might travel up to two weeks, um, autonomously doing all the measurements, and we're collecting multiple terabytes of data. We have customers throughout the world uh, do multiple inspections at a time, so we have a really large data set available, which brings us into the area of big data um, as well. So when you're about to do new data-centric services, which is the outcome of you know, collecting the data and, and providing the reports to our customers, um, you need to aggregate your storage solutions, which we did over the time. We started, as probably most companies, in the very beginning to have the data below your desk. Um, each and every project has its own data. You have the teams working on the data. They know what they are working about. Um, hardly anyone knows what the other team has. So the first um, way to getting more professional is you're using real service for that, um, which scales in a way, um, but still people need to know where the data is that they, w they will be using. And today we've aggregated to a single file system on an EMC Isilon storage, which is currently about 1.5 petabytes of data. And that is a good thing if you want to aggregate, but it does not solve all your problems. So in the beginning, there was, by this solution, quite some satisfaction as you get really high performance by that sort of setup. Uh, it's really fast performance. You could do more than two or three gigabytes of uh, reads and writes a second. But uh, over the years, when new services started uh, to be developed and the directory structures changed and the data formats are being optimized, new file formats get introduced, people under pressure get creative in storing their data away to get the project to have the deadline, and there is copies of copies of data around. It started to diverge again, which get us, gets us a terrible headache. So that's a mess that we just make call dark data, which according to Gartner, which they know what they are doing is understood to be the information assets that organizations collect, process and store during regular business activities, but generally fail to use for other purposes. And that's exactly what we faced. We had the, all the projects, all the teams working on their data, and hardly anyone knew what the other team was, was working on. So there was no single person at our 
company kn knowing what data is really available. So to get the overview image of what data is available, that we, 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 ha we had a hard time with that. And it's just too expensive uh, to stay at this point. Such an, e uh, such an Iceland-based storage is a really good storage, but it's costly. So our IT department, they wanted to uh, really know what data is stored on the Iceland and why is it stored on the Iceland, as it is such, a, such an expensive solution. Can you speak a little bit louder? I, I, I'm doing, I'm trying my best. Thank you. Um, so our lessons learned reveal that restructuring is uh, data is not the good idea. We did this when we moved on with our storage solutions. It was always the idea when the, to get to the next so let's start with a new structure, a new directory structure, make it better. But then people got more creative and it started to diverge again. And usually there was a good reason for this divergence in, in the data again that you just need to face. So the better idea, we thought, was to offer smart services to finding and retrieving the data. Um, that should re significantly reduce the costs at the initial stages, and this is actually what this talk is about. So we've planned a variety of interacting services, such as a file system scanner, uh, which will keep track of all the files that are stored on the Isilon. Um, that will generate, in its results, a smart table of contents. Um, we thought about a tagging service for these files that you can label it as, just as you would do with your photo collection at home, and a data provider that will serve the, all the data about the REST API, for example, and that will help to uh, get a first look into the data and its tags. And we will focus today uh, on the first component of this, which is a distributed file system scanner. So now we're already getting to the part two, which is about all the implementations. That is probably what you were expecting to see today. And keeping up with the tradition and being very naive, you will probably start in just looking what files are there with a the traditional find command. And that will probably just generate a, a, a file system, a list of files, which you can redirect to a file and reuse. Well, that command find slash tem type f that will just generate all the generate a list of files in your temp file system. And we could re-implement this using Python. And following the official Python documentation, you end up in something like this um, by importing from US and importing time to do some benchmarks if you like, with a given entry dir and providing an empty list of files. You can use OS walk with an entry directory which will generate um, on its way all the files and the directories it finds in the entry dir together with its path. As soon as you go and append these items to the empty list, you will get something very similar. That's just the list of files and it's costly to generate if you remember that you're going to a list a 1.5 petabyte system and that scan already takes 12 hours to complete. So that's not something that you're really up to in your day-to-day -day work if you are searching for files using that technology. And it's not even having any details. So we might be interested in other things like uh, the base directory of that file that you can, for later analysis, do some grouping about this. The file name itself, the type of the file, to also look how many data sets for the specific type you have, or how many images, or how many Word documents, or something like that the size of the file, the ownership, so who is owning the data, who would be, might be responsible for the data, and several timestamps for your bookkeeping that you can see how often are the files accessed and how old it is. And we came up with a last seen timestamp, which is quite a, a nice idea, I think. If you repeat this file system scan, then you might find your files again, and then you know that they're still available on your file system. If you're no longer finding these, the, the timestamp is not getting updated. So if you're searching on the result list, then you at least know that some file existed at some time ago, and you can search for it in the archives, maybe. Otherwise, if the last seen time scan is current, then you know you can access it. So with these additional properties, um, they can be retrieved by a NOAA stat call, which is also a bit more expensive. But by doing this, you can also just narrow down your list. When you're doing the OS walk, you will just get any 
item in the directory. Also symbolic links, heart links, device entries and stuff like that, which might not be useful for what we are about. So this is something that we could um, wipe out at the very beginning. So we're writing a little helper uh, for that, get file info, just gets a path. And by splitting up that in the directory in the file name and splitting up the file type by the split ext, you can get the very first and most important information. And then you do the OSTAT call and get the size and the owner and the group and these timestamps. And that is the basic concept that we'll, that it we'll see throughout these, this talk that will be the basic functionality that is called and all, all the items that you would find. So if you write, rewrite this um, and use that get file info method, the code changes to this. Um, we're still using OS walk for it, um, going over the directories. Now over all the files that you would find in each and every iteration, then you can look uh, to if it is a file or is a symbolic link. If that's the case, then just continue because that's not of interest. And if not, then get the information and append it to a list of files. And that scan takes 16 hours, as we have more information at hand. The old stack call is quite expensive. So that's still nothing to work with on a day-to-day -day base. But having this, it's quite neat to put it in a data frame, um, just for having the table. And as you might know, you can do some proper statistics on it already, just as counting and grouping and finding the largest files and stuff like that. That could be interesting in the future. Um, with these results organized like so, um, you might find insights from the numbers, such as the number of files that you have, um, the file count, how many files are there, who is the owner of this, the overall size per file type, and more. And how to generate this detailed view might be a bonus feature if we have enough time at the very end to see how that works. It will also be using the same technology. But it's also interesting to keep track of how long the directory scan is actually taking. If we had benchmarked it in more detail, then you would see maybe such a graph, um, which just shows you the number of files and uh, file entries or uh, entries in the directory and the scanning time that it took just for the beginning of this. And then you can see that you, in the very beginning it's, it's quite quick. Uh, there's just few files in the subdirectory and as the deeper you go the more files are there in the directory. And the sad thing is that these <coughs> file systems are very capable of storing as many files and directories as you want. But making a list of it may take a lot of time. So this is the base, that's the real problem that we are facing. But you can't see by the numbers here because it's from the very beginning, but we have directories on our island which have more than 60,000 entries in it. There was um, sort of an idea to debug an, an algorithm, was a search run for anomalies in the data set. And that guy has gotten very creative by um, making an image of each anomaly, uh, anomaly that he found and uh, stored it in a file in that same directory, ending up in more than 60,000 files of, in this. And that scan takes more than eight minutes just for that simple directory. So if you have some more of that, that will really take some time. And that's the thing to address now. So most of the directory can be quickly scanned, but as soon as you have a large number of entries, that will significantly slow down. Um, the OS walk based approach is the most traditional way of doing this, but luckily there is a version that is more efficient than this, introduced in Python 3, which is called OS scan deer. That is working on iterators and it will do, re will return uh, deer entry objects and they have the start calls included. This will probably give us a small speed up on this. So that's the change get file info function. It looks quite similar, and it is. It is now no longer working on the path, um, but on that directory entry object, and therefore just re reuses its start information to uh, return the same information than before. Um, and we will be using another neat concept um, to loop over the files now, 
based on Scandi because Scandi is just a function for one directory. It's no longer that OS walk thing. You have to re-implement the idea of uh, iterating over a complete subtree. And that's how we end up doing this. We will be creating an initial to-do list. And that to-do list is filled with all the entries in the top level <coughs> directory. And we will be trying to, with each and every iteration, empty that to-do list and refill it with new directories that we find. So when we find simple files, then we will just be appending those to our list of files. And all directories will be appended to the to-do list while we go. So in this, um, in this main block for entry in to-do, we are just really scanning each and every directory, trying to remove entries from our to-do list and refilling it until we're completing the complete uh, subdirectory scan. And this gives us another speed up again. So we're down from 16 hours to 14 again. We save two hours. Um, we're but we're not anywhere near of uh, using this on a quick base uh, in your daily work. And that is just because of the blocking behavior that we see when we have a directory with many entries in it. And we are working on a single CPU. So can we go multi-core then? Of course, yes, we could scale a bit. And uh, the idea is to distinguish between directory and file entries and handle them separately. Um, and to do the, the next scan um, even before we have completed the current one, which is taking a long time. That's the idea of going parallel, um, having multiple CPUs at work. So we still should have a single to-do list of directory, but a number of workers completing the job. And the most straightforward approach for this is using a mapping concept behind it. So you have a list of directories that we should scan and have some workers and have a system which will be applying that scanning function onto that list of parameters. That's the basic mapping approach that you can use in Python. Um, so let's create a function that we can use in the mapping process, which mimics the OS walk. And that is the scan deer, um, which takes a root directory, which will create a list of directories and files. And as soon as we iterating over the scan the results and that directory is, that entry is a directory, we will be appending it to our directory list, else we will append it to our file list and just return it with its corresponding path so that we have the same calling uh, API that we had with the OS walk. And now the idea is to have a pool of workers that is mapping the functionality, the mapping our Scandia function onto our to-do list, reducing it on the fly. So that's what it looks like. Um, it will be using multiprocessing for that, for example, which creates processes with that multiprocessing pool. I've chosen two CPUs for this, the machine that I use that has two cores. And then I'm in an endless loop, in that while true loop, trying to empty my to-do list. As soon as that's happening, I'm really exiting my, true, my while true block and I'm finished my work. Else, I will do a mapping to that pool with that Scandia function and my non-empty to-do list. And it will extend my to-do list with all the results. And then we're repeating this until we finished our to-do list to be empty. This is what it looks like, a um, couple of columns. The first one is the one with the iterations. The second one is the length of our to-do list. So you can see that it's really um, filling up until a certain point and then it's trying to empty it again. And that got a note of speed up. We are at seven hours again, which is half the time than before, which is good. It scales nicely by a factor of two from 14 to seven hours, but it's still nothing really good in off to do in office hours. <coughs> So what we really should do is scaling out using not only multiple calls, but multiple computers to complete the work. And that is something um, to keep up with the time. You can do with a modern environment. Um, that is the one that is representing my environment most um, with the Linux boxes. So those of you who are working with Windows might be on the south side now. It's not sure that is really working on Windows. 
and uh, everything else could be done on Linux machines and also on Mac OS um, with using an, a proper Anaconda environment. So what we'll be using for this to go uh, to scale out is Dask. Um, Dask Distributed, which is a, from the docs, a lightweight library for distributed computing in Python. It extends the concurrent futures and Dask APIs to moderate sized clusters which you can simply install using conda install dask distributed from the conda forge channel and then you're ready to go. And dask itself, it has been created to address large and memory intense problems. But it was meant to be a simple solution for problems where data to be worked on no longer fits into memory, which um, in the old days before dask you had to split up that data manually and, and find your way how to iteratively, iteratively um, solve your problem and work with intermediate results to your final result set. And or uh, maybe enter the world of distributed computing using MPI, for example, which can be tricky and hard. Um, it is also a bit like uh, for this sort of problem, using a sledgehammer to crack your nut. DAS, well the DAS you could use to locally, uh, to, to extend your local storage with, uh, with an SSD, for example. That was the basic idea, um, to be a drop-in replacement for NumPy arrays, uh, implementing the same API. So as soon as you had a NumPy matrix, for example, no longer fitting into memory, you would have to split up a manual, as, it's, as I just said before. Uh, with the idea of Dask, you will be using the Dask, Dask API, and Dask will do all the fancy stuff below the hood for you. So you can must not change your algorithms in any way to, to be able to use that. What it does under the hood is creating a task graph, which is iterated. Um, it's a bit like um, if you're having to sum up some numbers and multiplying numbers, then you end up in, in doing a graph with that numbers and say 2 plus 2. Um, in terms of a graph, it's plus operation with these two numbers, and two and two makes four. That creates also a task graph, which you can iterate on. And Dask is doing pretty much the same thing for all the operations that you would do on your NumPy array um, to make the work complete if it's no longer fitting into memory. And once they introduce some network communication code, they will be able to Oh, not only use the local CPUs and go multi-core, but also use multiple computers to perform the work, which was nice. And that is what is been implemented by the distributed part of Dask. And that is uh, exactly what we will be using now. So the idea is to have a central scheduler keeping track of all the work and have a number of workers which will be performing all the work. And if you're starting in, in, in exploring how Dask works, it's very advisable to start off with a local cluster. Um, as you don't have to set up your network for this, and it will behave exactly like the final solution. So let's do exactly that. So the idea is of, in, in instead of creating a multi-processing multi pool, we will create a local cluster with the same number of processes and connect the network scheduler to it. And it's still the idea of emptying that dynamic to-do list, um, which now will help future objects, which is a concept <coughs> introduced um, by the asynchronous programming idea into Python. These futures will directly return, and the corresponding results um, that can be expected to come at some point in time once the job is complete, so they can be awaited. In Dask distributed, you can use the as completed function to iterate over the results. This helps to um, loop over all the results as they come in, instead of the order they have been filled in. And so using the local cluster backend should be quite comparable to what we've known from the multiprocessing pool, and I'm, I'm sure you can recognize this. So we are creating a local cluster there um, at the very top with the same number of workers that we have in a multiprocessing pool, and we will be creating a client which is connecting to that cluster. Um, <coughs> That's the basic system, that's the basic thing that really is implementing the same thing as the multiprocessing pool. And we are also preparing our to-do list, uh, which is now called futures that list, and submit our jobs to, that, uh, to the client, with that client, to the workers initially. And then we are iterating in that wild block 
over the futures list um, and take each and every future out of it as it is completed, retrieve the results and extend our list of files and directories again. And if you look at it, it will pretty much look the same as we had before. It will take eight hours instead of seven, which is a drawback at the very beginning, but it's, it is a slight overhead in it with the scheduler and the workers doing the jobs. But that will be changing in a minute um, by getting to a real distributed <coughs> cluster. And this one you can build by a, sl a little helper utility which is provided by DASK. Distributed as well, which is the DASK Secure Shell helper, where you can start on a number of workers, in this case on 10 machines, uh, with 16 processes and one thread. By this I just decide to use real process instead of the threading approach. You can exchange it and uh, we'll see just one process and have it in, in 60 threads, for example. Um, something you should decide based on your problem that you want to solve. If you want to work it, then you should make sure that all the nodes have the same file system mounted in and that there is an Anaconda environment installed at the very same location. Because the idea behind Dask Distributed is to take the source code, deliver it over the network by the scheduler to the workers, unserialize it and execute it. So if you're depending on external libraries, they should be somewhere in place. And then we look at the, the change that we need to do. It's a rather simple one. Um, you're no longer doing the local cluster thing as we had done it externally using Dask Secure Shell and connect our client to the node at the proper port. And the rest is just the same. So that's just the idea of going from a local host with multi-CPU to a distributed cluster. And if you see at the results, the first rows look pretty much the same but we've completed that job in less than an hour. And that is really a vast speed up that we've been waiting for. And if you look at the numbers correctly, the uh, two middle columns is the number of directories that I have been found in, in our directory scan on the Isilon, which is half a million directories. Um, and these half a million directories have more than 60 million files in it. So that's a large number and it's better be organized. And there's something other need to see as soon as you go to the distributed cluster, something which I could stare on all day. Um, that is the, an excerpt of the status page that the Dask scheduler provides. So if, it, the, if this is up and running, then you can uh, travel to a, wo a web page offered by that scheduler based on Bokeh, and it will show you the status ongoing in time. Here, each and every row, every bar in the top is a single job that is done by one of the 160 workers. And the progress bar at the bottom is showing the advancements in your complete job, in this case, emptying that to-do list. So my message to take home, we're near the end already by rushing through it, is you could scale up from the very beginning as it is simple. It's uh, as soon as you're familiar with the concept of mapping functionality to a list of parameters, it's in quite an easy way. You're starting off with multiprocessing pool. As soon as that's successful, you're switching over to Dask distributor with a local cluster. And if that is going OK, then you are setting up your network with a distributed cluster with as many cores as you like. Um, you shouldn't force creating structures prior to collecting your data. It takes a lot of time and effort to try to get structure into it. For us, the better idea was to offer this smart table of contents. So the result of this is that we, by doing the scan, created a list of CSV files. And these CSV files get uploaded to a MongoDB database. And on top of this is another service which is providing the data that it finds so you can explore it quickly. And we run it every night, so we're quite up to date with the contents. Um, you should uh, publish the table of contents as often as you could. You should document the data, which is a really overlooked one, that if you're working with the data, you're absolutely familiar with it. But the next team might have a hard time in understanding what the data that you use really means. Um, you should create awareness of what's there and what's the value behind this is. So 
within your project, you usually just use the data. Once it is complete, what are you doing with the data? Are you interested in the data after your work is complete? <coughs> um, most usually, no, because work is done. Next, next thing to come. But as the data is stored on that uh, file system, on, on an Eisler, for example, it's pretty expensive. So you should put some value to it. And value to it is something like um, tagging it, making it usable for others, and keeping track of what's behind the data. So we're all ready through. Um, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer it. Thank you. Session. So please. Yeah, so this is more of a distributed uh, table of content uh, generation rather than having to worry about the distributed file system. That's right, yeah. So, so the Isilon is already a distributed solution for itself, which is, which is uh, able to scale out pretty, pretty easily, yeah. So that's the idea to, to have a smart usage of, of listing the files and use it. So is that scale on demand? Or Say it again, please. Is it scaling of the file system on demand or by button click? Or, or the file system, how to scale it is the question. Yeah, the, um, the yeah you will uh, buy new nodes and attach it to them, and it will um, rebalance everything that is stored on it and provide you with some new network NICs to scale out your bandwidth as well. There was some bonus content you might be able to Yes. It's, <laughs> it's here. It's here. Um, if there are no more questions to that, then we get the bonus round. It's just a quick one. Um, it's the idea how I'm, I'm uh, scanning on the results and get some insights onto it. And there is the idea, as, as I said, all the results get stored in CSV files. And as soon as that's the case, and you have many CSV files, a CSV file for each and every worker, and so in this case 160, you can use the Pandas distributed data frame to access that and accelerate um, your uh, analysis of insights. Um, that's the idea how to do it. Um, you use read CSV on the CSV files and explain your data and help it to understand the data. And then you can um, define tasks that should be completed on this Pandas data frame. So it's again the idea of creating tasks which will be iterated on to complete. In this case, it was just getting an idea of the number of files that are there, the size of all files, the number of SRH files, five files, that's a special format that we use, the size of it, a number of project-related files and the size of project-related files and some more specific stuff to do uh, the directory name, the extensions, the UID, and the project. And then you use uh, the compute method to complete all the tasks. That's where the fun starts, which looks like this. That's, again, our progress bar. And there you can see the workers um, completing all the related works by iterating over the, uh, the subtasks that need to be done. And this is a real-time uh, thing, so I'm hopping over 60 million entries in a couple of seconds um, to get my insights. And what, what comes out of this is you, you merge the results back um, to the task labels that we had, and then you get the basic idea. So that's from a, a previous of the runs with just 40 million files and, and uh, not even 500 terabytes of data. Um, and there is there's already something very interesting here that you say we have 437 terabytes of da uh, data all in all and only 372 are organized in projects. So there's a vast amount of data around which is still dark data, which is no one aware of and which should be restructured. Is that the idea? I don't believe so. The better idea is to make it available by these sorts of systems. But that's not really it. <laughs> Do you use some kind of uh, time series database? Um, we have time series data within our data files that we use. That's the usual suspect. If you if you if you look at the pi the, the peaks traveling through the pipeline, it is obviously timestamp related. 
it's irregular. It's it's hard to to uh, to get it done, but it's not organizing these files in sort of this file system or database. So what database do you use to store it, or is it just still in the...? It's MongoDB currently, okay. um, but it's a matter of, uh, as we started prototyping it using MongoDB, it's something that we could change at any time as we have a layer on top of it, which is the REST API, yeah. and that's the, th the final thing that's the API the users do see. Okay. So I will solve this problem your architecture, what's, what's possible bottlenecks that you've got just now? Bottlenecks? Um, they well, are this obviously would, you know. The, the, we had the bottlenecks when, when people were searching for files and they didn't have any chance. So they're, using, they're sitting in front of their Windows desktop and using the finder functionality to find files. On a 1.5 petabyte file system, that's not a good idea. It never ever completes. You get the impression you need to reboot your computer or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was the idea to ha have a clever table of contents behind, which was designed by the user expectations. And that's the idea when, when it comes from to, to analyzing this. So these are sorts of the questions that people have, like the IT department, how many files are there, how old are there, can you help us in, in sorting these things out? And that's the, uh, the idea behind it. So the bottleneck is no longer there as that scan completes in an hour. It is done every night. Uh, no one really takes care of it. It's, the next morning there is the new table of contents available and you can work on it. If you're running it just every night, is there a reason why you need to have it taking one hour? Can, can it not just be like a 12 hour it, process? Yes, it could be. Um, the basic idea was to not have it at night, but to scale it even more to be able to do it online at some point, maybe in a couple of minutes. And you can do it. Um, it's just a matter of how many workers they are available and using that Dask Secure Shell approach you can spin up as many workers as you like. You can even do it dynamically. Was the networking part of that difficult to set up, the Dask um, workers? No, as, as soon as you have, um, say, clones of your computers mm. all behaving simultaneously the same, yep. then you have the Anaconda installation at the very same spot mm -hmm. and have your Secure Shell set up to not requiring passwords. Then you can simply use Dask Secure Shell and it spins up your cluster in a couple of seconds and then you can do your work. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.